Hi folks, it's Rob Flux here from Property Developer Network coming to you live for another Sunday session. This week's topic is the financial aftershock from COVID-19. It's a little bit of a more serious subject. I've put uh, quite a bit of research into this particular element to try and give you guys the latest and greatest as to what is actually happening right here, right now in the market, uh, specifically in and around the Australian uh, market uh, and, and property in particular. Having said that, I uh, need to, uh, I guess, have a small disclaimer. Um, I'm gonna be talking about some financial uh, elements here. So I'm giving you an up, uh, up front that I do not have an AFSL license. Uh, I can't give you legal or, or, or general advice. So this is educational purposes only. You should always seek uh, advice from your relevant professional. What I wanna do from here, folks, is give you a little bit of an, uh, an overview or an understanding of actually how the economy works before I actually look at the symptoms as to what's actually happening underneath. So this is like the economy 101. Now, in order to do this, uh, I wanna give a, a great deal of credit to a gentleman by the name of Ray Dalio. So Ray is one of the uh, richest men in the world. Uh, and he did a presentation called How the Economic Machine Works. So this is uh, elements of that with, uh, I guess, a few modifications in order to fit in and around the Australian market uh, so that it, it uh, sort of genuinely applies. So uh, if you would like to uh, Google that one, Ray Dalio, the, uh, how the economic machine works, that will go into a little bit more detail in, that how, in how, that, how the economy works uh, as a whole. Uh, but having said that, let's have a look and break it down into its smallest elements. Uh, and then from the smallest elements, we'll then build that up into uh, how, how the economy works and how it's actually performing right here, right now. So you can see uh, how we're actually tracking and give, uh, give it a little bit of a score. So firstly, what is a transaction? So a transaction has a buyer, clearly, and it also has a seller. Now a buyer typically has some cash or some credit uh, and they uh, wanna transact something, which is usually a good, a service or a stock. Seems fairly simple in that regard. When the transaction actually occurs, I guess the money changes hands, the goods, uh, I guess the goods get swapped, the money goes over to the seller and at this point that seller now has the cash and they can now become a new buyer. Now with them becoming a new buyer, they can cause, I guess, uh, create other additional transactions uh, elsewhere around the place. Now, as we start to scale that, there's clearly many, many people that can uh, do transactions. There are also businesses that can do transactions. Governments can do transactions. Banks can do transactions. And countries can actually do transactions. And it's not just people to people or business to business, but it's uh, people to business and business to government and government to banks. and So it's all very intertwined. But effectively, it all breaks down to what is a single individual transaction. From that, we, where we go there is as your income increases, basically you want to buy more and more stuff. So you go to the bank who says, well, we want to make more and more money. So bank's got an idea. Would you like some credit? Uh, and you say, sure. And in order to do that, I'll give you back what I've borrowed. Plus, I'll give you back some interest. Assuming that you actually qualify for that loan, um, you guys come to an agreement and you now get some credit. Now what happens is you actually have both cash and credit. So your total spending actually goes up. Because your total spending goes up, the, the number of transactions that you can do equally goes up. Um, so there's two parts to credit though. Then this is what we need to understand. So firstly, the banks deem uh, from their side of the transaction, they deem that to be an asset and that is a future income. For us, we deem that to be a liability, okay? So that is a debt. So we are effectively borrowing future money with the, the view of spending it now uh, so we can actually increase our lifestyle and uh, improve our living standards, those sorts of things. Now, what happens there is as we spend money, both money and credit, that in turn creates the next person and the food chain who also gets some income. They also have the ability to go to their bank they then in turn transact with more people. So with both money and credit being available, then our economy grows because we're not just spending cash, but we're spending cash plus credit. So the number of transactions grows and every time the number of transactions grow, that's more income to the next person. 
that's then in turn more income for the next person up the food chain and up and up we go. The problem is what happens when credit is not available. So instead of a money bag, we now have just cash. We're not actually getting credit at all, but we have limited cash, which means we have limited amount to spend, which means the next person that we're purchasing from also has limited amount of money. So they can't you know, employ people in their businesses and, and uh, therefore their, uh, their people potentially go unemployed, which men then passes down the food chain to say, well, there's less money in the economy again. And so either way, whether we have credit, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and the economy goes up. And if we don't have credit, then it's a self-defeating policy and we start to go down. What that effectively creates is some market cycles. So as we uh, start to increase our credit, uh, we increase our spending uh, ability. And as we start to pay our, our debts back, given that we uh, have incurred those debts and we've effectively future spending, then we actually create more and more of a burden on ourselves as we start to pay more and more of that principal back. Um, and so we go through periods where we have uh, a, a massive amount of ability to grow the market. Uh, and there are other periods where the market tends to slow down based on the credit lending policies that may actually be around at the time. So when we overlay that over, over our productivity growth, what tends to happen is we have a little bit of a cycle that starts to occur. So as we have credit, our debt starts to increase, our productivity goes up, but as we then start to pay our debt back, the productivity actually grows. Now, over time, we're still growing, I guess, in an upwards direction, but not as fast when we're actually repaying debt. So, and that is typically when credit becomes harder to become available. And as you'll see later in this presentation, we're coming into a period right now where getting access to credit is gonna be a little bit harder and harder to achieve. So how does that actually work? So the RBA controls the amount of credit that is actually in the economy. So the RBA does that in one of two ways. They either raise or lower interest rates or alternatively, they actually start to print money. Now, as we know right now, interest rates are at an all-time low. Uh, and we also have uh, the government doing massive stimulus packages at the moment. So the, the government is trying uh, everything it can within its power right now to try and stimulate our economy. But have, let's have a look at how that breaks down uh, in, in a, uh, to us as an individual lender. So as the RBA lifts the interest rates, um, that in turn impacts what the banks to do. And as the interest rates go up, the borrowers disappear because basically uh, they can't afford to actually pay back the loans because they don't have the income streams or the serviceability, et cetera. So they tend to disappear. So lifting interest rates slows us down. Whereas if we do the opposite, if we actually lower interest rates, then it becomes more and more affordable. So then people then come back into the market. So that's quite a little bit of an overview as to how things are working. Now let's look at how we're actually tracking with all the market indicators and see what, how we're doing from a health perspective. And then we can look back at um, those, uh, uh, I guess, basics and see what are the likely implications that might be coming from that. So let's have a look at some of our health indicators. So firstly, interest rates. So as I said before, if we have low interest rates, it encourages lending, i.e. credit which then stimulates the spending, which then drives the economy. If there's more money in the market, uh, whether it be cash or credit, then there are more transactions that are actually going to occur. Now, as we know, we're at all time record lows at the moment. So now if there are high interest rates, it does the opposite. It just discourages lending, um, it lowers the total spending and slows down the economy. So let's have a look at the RBA cash rate and uh, where it has been historically and where it is currently right now. So as we can see, this is a history of the RBA cash rate over time. And let's have a look at uh, some, some key points and key indicators. So uh, all the way back in the 1990s, we actually had a recession. It was called the recession that we actually had to have. Uh, interest rates were up around the 17% uh, mark. Um, I had some property at that point in time and trust me, it hurt trying to pay interest rates at that point in time. We also had the GFC. So government had to, to raise some interest rates there to try and slow us down a little bit uh, and then had to lower it consequently afterwards in order to kickstart the economy uh, as well. But ever since then, we've actually been struggling to kickstart the economy in any massive way. 
And so the government has been slowly, slowly, slowly ratcheting down interest rates to right now where the point where they're at all time record lows. Now that was happening well before COVID actually came along. And that's, I guess, a key indicator to us to say, well, it's not just that COVID is here, but what were the, the conditions of us coming into COVID that now COVID has now uh, amplified? So uh, absolute record lows and it's 0.25, uh, I believe is the current RBA cash rate. So uh, very, very low. Now, something that I noticed uh, in the news not so long ago is the fact that the federal government has uh, put together a pr proposal to the Senate to say that they could potentially be banning cash transactions that are greater than $10,000. Now, what that means is that there's potential that we could actually go into negative interest rate um, timelines. Now, if you have a look at the, the uh, date on this particular news article, it's the 28th of February. So this is before COVID really came along. So at this point in time, federal government was saying, look, we still need to kickstart our economy. Near zero interest rates aren't working. Negative interest rates are now potentially the next thing on the agenda. Now, why does having a cash ban uh, uh, help us with negative interest rates? Well, if interest rates go below zero, that means it actually costs you to have your cash in the bank. And so it encourages you to take the money out of the bank and actually go and spend it. So one of the incentives that can be done is if you go into that lower uh, negative territory is make sure that, that cash is not spendable uh, all by itself. Uh, and so it then forces you, uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. Um, it forces you then to make sure that you're actually using your money and not actually keeping it in the bank where it's actually getting eroded away. So, so that was sitting in and around uh, our, our economy before COVID actually came along. So our next indicator, consumer sentiment. Now, if we have a high sentiment, then uh, we tend to uh, get very, very greedy. Uh, spending increases, the economic activity uh, uh, in turn increases. And so we can see that we have a lot of confidence in the market and we're willing to spend because, you know, we're a little bit bravo uh, as to what's going on. If we've got a low sentiment, then the, exactly the opposite is happening. So there's fear in the market, spending stops and ac economic activity declines. So let's again have a look at where our cons consumer uh, sentiment index currently sitting. So this is from uh, Westpac Corporation. So I want to point out some uh, previous lows. So again, that uh, Australian recession that we had, uh, very, very low. And this is the GFC, again, very, very low. And what I want to point out is that right now, we're, our consumer sentiment is actually lower than the GFC uh, previous low, which means if we've got a very, very low consumer sentiment, it means that we're unlikely to want to go out and spend. We're going to be very, very conservative with the money that we've actually got in our pockets. And we're not going to go out and spend it frivolously. And instead, we're going to uh, be sitting on our hands uh, as much as we can. Um, and we certainly won't be going out to try and uh, uh, borrow money at this point in time because uh, it doesn't really work for us in where we don't have confidence. We don't want to go into uh, more and more debt. Now, let's have a look at business confidence. It's another indicator. So again, where there's high sentiment, uh, businesses believe that there's prosperity and lots of clients around and those sorts of things. So businesses tend to uh, increase their spending and they invest uh, in themselves with both capital and increasing of staff to try and grow the business. The opposite occurs. So if there's low sentiment, we then have hardship in the businesses. Businesses are reluctant to, stop, uh, to hire and they tend to cut costs and quite often staff is one of the first things that actually go. So let's have a look at our business confidence index. Again, this is us at GFC. And again, look at the business confidence is well below uh, our pre-GFC levels. As a matter of fact, it's almost fallen off a cliff. It's, it's, uh, it's dropped that far that fast. And that's largely because nobody really knows what's happening right now. We've had to shut the doors. We've had to uh, send people home. We've not got money coming in uh, the doors. Um, some people have actually let staff go. So there's lots going on and we don't know when we open the doors up again, whether or not the clients are going to come back. And there's good reason for that because there's the consumer confidence is also low. So the business confidence is low because consumer confidence is low. 
So if consumers aren't wanting to spend, then businesses don't know whether or not they've actually got some revenue coming through. So it starts to become this self-defeating uh, prophecy um, and hence the uh, business confidence index has dropped massively at this point in time. Let's now look at our next indicator, employment. So low unemployment means that there's more jobs and more people are actually in the economy actually spending money. And if they're spending money, that means that they actually have uh, more ability to borrow funds because they've got money coming into their, uh, I guess the next person down the food chain has got money coming into their pockets, which means higher economic growth. Again, the opposite of that, high unemployment means less jobs, less people spending money, less ability to borrow funds and a slower economic growth. So let's have a look at where we currently are with that. Oh, I forgot to mention underemployment. So underemployment is where the, I guess these are not official stats. They're not actually recorded officially anywhere because people are still technically employed, but it means that they may be working less hours than they were previously. So they're still on the books, uh, but they, I guess it has a very, very similar effect to high unemployment because they have less money coming in the door, which means that they are less able to actually go out and spend and have less ability to actually borrow. Now, to get the actual stats as to where we are, I wanted to point this out. This is a, uh, a, a timeline that's come from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, and it basically shows how and when they actually release all of their official unemployment statistics. And the key thing that I want to point out here is that the March figures that were released on the 16th of April, which was only a few days ago, is actually for a period all the way back here at the start of March. So there's a one month lag behind when the official figures are captured and when they're actually reported. Now you'll note looking at the rest of the timeline that this was very much, most of that was prior to the World Health Organization declaring a pandemic. And it was very much well before the social distancing rules and all those sorts of things apply. So the current stats that were released officially by the ABS only uh, a week or so ago don't actually reflect where we are actually right this very moment. Now, in order to do that, the next period is this one here. Uh, the April figure is actually due out on the 14th of May. This is going to be a lot more realistic as to how and where we're tracking right this very second. Uh, so there's a bit of a lag uh, on those results coming through. Having said that, the ABS aren't the only people who actually do statistics. The ABS are the official source, but uh, a place called Roy Morgan also does some research, but this is not 100% categoric. What this is, is going out and actually uh, doing surveys with, the, with people in the, in the market and then extrapolating the results. Uh, and what they've found, what Roy Morgan has found is that the unemployment rates, according to their calculations, are 10.9% right now. And the underemployment is about 97 So when you actually combine those two together, the, I guess, unemployed and the underemployed, we're about 20.6%, uh, uh, I guess, people with less income coming in. So that's less spending ability, less borrowing power, less uh, ability to actually uh, kickstart the economy, uh, which is why a, a lot of that consumer sentiment has actually uh, dropped significantly. So let's have a look at some historicals as to how this is actually traced over time. So again, unemployment rate over history. So uh, the, the stock market crash, uh, sorry, the global stock crash, I should say. So at that point, we're about 11 percent, sorry, about 10 and a half percent unemployment rate. So uh, when we look at where we are right now, we're much, much higher. If we look at the uh, 1990s recession, so the recession that we had to have, that was up towards the 11% mark uh, from an unemployment perspective. Um, GFC, that was only around the uh, four and a bit percent mark. And so it, when we look at those projections of 10 and a bit percent right now, plus the, I guess, underemployment being up at around 20%, we're, we're just off the charts right this very moment as to where we're tracking with regards to our unemployment side of things. So what's the stock market saying with all of this? Well, stock market uh, is an early indicator in a lot of uh, our uh, economy because of the fact that stock is very liquid. So you can actually transact stock within minutes. So if you want to offload it, there's, there's typically going to be someone who will take it off your hands uh, straight away. Whereas property, 
has a big lag on it. It's quite slow in the uh, in the process in order to get that uh, get to the stock market. Sorry, to get to the property market. So let's look at the stock market. So as you can see, uh, in March we uh, started to fall off a cliff in the all ordinary, all ordinaries index uh, and and dropped quite significantly till just before the end of March. Uh, and then what we've seemed to have done now is stabilise a little. Um, so I'm going to come to that at, uh, in a couple of moments. So I just want you to, to say that right now the market said, okay, we've stopped the free fall, but we're not sure are we going to recover yet or is there a little bit more free fall to go? They're saying, let's just kind of sit here in a holding pattern and work out what's actually going on. If we look at the American economy, the Dow Jones index, very similar has happen happened to them. So very similar timelines, very similar drop and very similar uh, partial recovery and uh, a little bit of a stabilise. But what I want to point out here, folks, is if we look back in time at some of those big economic uh, impacts where all of those indicators uh, showed us uh, and all those other times. So every time we had the, uh, the 1990s recession and the stock market crash and uh, GFC, all those sorts of things, all of our indicators are well above or, or in proximity to where those are right now. So let's go back and have a look at those events with regards to the stock market. So if we have a look at the All Ordinaries Index, way back at the point of the GFC, so that was the, uh, the uh, start of the GFC uh, right there. You'll notice that it went straight into a crash and then it went into a little bit of a recovery. So right now, we don't know if what we've come to is, I guess, the testing of the market similar to this here, but then it went into another free fall, then did another test and then another free fall and then did another test. So right now I'd be cautious with the stock market to say, is it actually a recovery? Is it actually a stabilization? Or is it just kind of testing the market to go, well, where are we actually gonna go? Now it's too early to predict right now, uh, but uh, I have some hunches. I'm not gonna uh, speculate on that uh, publicly, uh, but I would say watch this space folks. Now, if we similarly have, a, so from a recovery point of view, uh, the peak of that uh, took us quite some time to actually get back to the peak of the GFC. And I would actually argue that uh, even then we had another bit of a drop. So it took us many, many years to recover from our GFC stock market uh, levels uh, to, to where they were, I guess, just prior to coming into this COVID environment. So we're just approaching that and now we've hit this uh, little bit of a bump. If we look at Dow Jones in a very similar timeline, okay, so... Again, that is the GFC level. And again, there was a drop and a test and a re like recovery and a test, and then another drop and then a recovery and test, and then another drop and a recovery and a test. So the indicators would be that right now we need to be overly cautious that what the stock market is doing this very second might be, if we look at history, history repeating itself, it might be a, is it trying to test the, the market and actually recover? Or B, is it just in a little bit of a holding pattern while it tries to work out what's going on before it decides whether or not it's going to plummet? Um, so we don't really know that at this point in time. And again, American market uh, took several years before they actually recovered to their pre-GFC and they've got then shot way, way past. And that tends to happen uh, in economies over time. So if we look at all of the different uh, crashes over time. So we've got World War I, we've got World War II, we've got different recessions. Um, you'll see that every time there's actually been a crash, we have actually recovered and gone past the previous high, but it's just taken us anywhere from three to seven years, typically with one instance of it taking 15 years to actually get there. So if we end up going into one of these, uh, I guess, longer term lulls, it could actually take quite some time to actually recover. And so what I'm trying to say to you is uh, we need to be prepared for just in case this may actually occur. With that in mind, is this a perfect storm? So are we in a situation where everything has gone against us at this point in time and no matter what we try to do, can we actually kickstart the economy? So let's have a look at firstly the facts that are sitting in and around this. So interest rates are at record low, which means that looking at our, our uh, Economics 101 that I showed you before, the RBA has no wiggle room to stimulate the economy without going into negative interest rates. The lever is all the way at the bottom. 
So they can't drop it any lower unless they go negative. The government has already presented a policy on a cash ban prior to COVID-19 actually coming into effect in order to the, for them to prepare to go into negative interest territory. That was prior to COVID, folks. So, which means that they already thought that, that we were struggling to kickstart the economy going back several months, well before COVID actually came into existence. So I just want you to keep that in mind. Our unemployment is at a record high. So now, right now, it's uh, the ABS are projecting that it's potentially in and around that 10% mark, uh, but we won't know those official stats uh, for, for a good couple of weeks. But Roy Morgan has predicted that we're at 16% of unemployed and about 20 and a bit percent uh, of underemployed. Uh, so, you know, our, we're at record high indicators at the moment, which means that there's limited incomes coming in, which means that spending in the economy has slowed down. But sorry, not only will it, but it, but it actually has slowed down and it's going to slow down a heck of a lot more. But by how much, we don't really know. And that really depends on can we get let out? Can we then go back to work? And if we go back to work, will people start to come spending money with us again? Remember, sentiment is low at the moment. So even if we put, uh, even if we open up the doors, will people come and actually transact? Now, there's going to be uh, quite a bit of time before people actually start to build that confidence back as to whether or not we're actually going to recover. So in the short term, I think our economy, I won't say has stalled, but it's going to take a little bit of time to try and get our, our momentum back, assuming we can actually get let out. Um, and I'm quite optimistic that we are going to be uh, let out from that perspective, but we just don't know what the longer term ramifications of that are. So the world economy is impacted. Remember I said before, going back to our 101, that some of those transactions are actually us importing goods and exporting goods and, and all of those sorts of things. So our economy is driven by our imports and exports as well as what we actually do in, uh, inside our own borders. And our two biggest partners being the USA and China, well, they're some of the two biggest people that have actually been impacted by these COVID, um, this COVID pandemic. And so the USA is in a world of pain right now um, with regards to unemployment rates and the number of deaths that they've got and a whole bunch of, of things like that. Uh, and there's a lot of debate and speculation as to whether or not the figures that are actually coming out of China are actually accurate. Now, I'm not going to speculate myself on that other than to say it's an unknown commodity as to whether our two biggest trading partners that we've got out there are actually in a position where they can trade with us which means that we may be trading all by ourselves if we have a look at some of those i guess the the, the trading that we've got not only do we have imports and exports uh, but that we have to worry about but some of our biggest uh, commodities that we actually export obviously we've got things like coal iron ore um, uh, and, and natural gas. Um, so, you know, the resources industry, well, if other, work, if other countries aren't actually employing, if they're not recovering themselves, they will have less and less requirement for those resources. So that could potentially slow down. Um, our next biggest trade is actually tourism uh, and also education. Uh, so international students. So uh, they're, they're our two biggest uh, things apart from resources. Now, we've got our borders locked at the moment, so tourism's not going to come back for a little while. Uh, and our international students that are currently here right now, they can't really go home, otherwise they can't come back. Uh, and they're actually safer here right now. So they're going to stay here for a little while. But, uh, you know, I've seen lots of news stories at the moment saying that the education uh, industry in the university sector is predicting a $16 billion drop over the next couple of years uh, from losing the income uh, from those students coming through. And then if we have a look at the next lot of facts, the Australian government has started injecting billions into the economy to start to stimulate the economy. Now, what they've really tried to do uh, in stimulating is try to keep people employed because what they don't want is that 10 and a bit percent of unemployed plus the nine and a bit percent of underemployed, they don't want the underemployed to turn into unemployed because at that point we're in uncharted territory. So everything that the government has been doing right now has been to try and keep people 
in business, even though the doors are locked right now, they're trying to keep them actually there so that when the doors open up again, they're not trying to recover from 20% unemployment rates, uh, but rather 10%, which is going to be easier to recover from, but certainly not easy. So what I'm seeing here is there's actually a disconnect right now between the markets and the indicators. So the, the markets being the stock market has done a recovery and it's kind of sitting there going, what do I do? Okay, I'm not sure if I want to recover. I'm not sure if I want to drop. But all of the indicators that we've shown you, as I've said, we've got record uh, unemployment. We've got record low interest rates. We've got consumer index, um, uh, consumer confidence index uh, at a record low, business uh, index at a record low. Everything, all of the indicators that we've got are pointing in the wrong direction, folks. And so the markets right now are kind of sitting there going, hmm, we don't know what to do next. So the question that you need to be considering is, are the, market, are the markets themselves right and the indicators wrong? Or alternatively, are the indicators right and the markets wrong? Now, a lot of that is going to be uh, very, very subjective based on what happens in the next month or so. Do we A, get let out and, and, uh, and, and start to, to get back to a relative normality? And B, will people actually start spending when they do? Now, I don't know about you, but the last time I went to the shops, uh, a lot of shops are actually physically shut down. So, you know, if you go into the retail sector, the doors are locked. Uh, if you go into uh, fast food outlets in food courts in shopping centers, there's only a third of the operators that were actually uh, previously open still there. So if there's nobody in the shops spending money, then all of those subsidiary shops need to close down as well. So we need to be really, really careful as to what's actually going to happen next. So the question then is, will there be a recession? Okay, so given where we are, we're teetering on the edge right this very second. So will there be a recession? So let's have a look at what some of the symptoms of that are. Well, technically, a recession comes when you've got two negative GDP quarters in a row. So we have undoubtedly had G3 as a negative. So that is, that is been and gone uh, and is definitely in negative territory. Q4, which we're just at the start of right now, is very likely. And because we're still not let out, and by the time we get let out, we'll actually be halfway through Q4. And then there's not really much time for it to actually recover. So it's a little bit of a projection, but I think it's fairly safe to say that from a pure technicality point of view, I think we technically will be triggering into recession territory. Now, stock market and property uh, markets will lose value. So the stock market is already down. We've just shown you some stats on that, that the stock market is down. Uh, and it's kind of sitting there right now going, don't know if I should recover or not, but I'm going to see what actually happens. The property market has slowed down and is on the brink. So typically what happens is the stock market is a lead indicator of what happens to the property market. Now the stock market has dropped and then stabilized. So the property market has slowed, but not yet dropped off the precipice, okay? Uh, so the number of transactions have slowed down, the number of buyers in the market have slowed down, uh, and there's the occasional bargain to be had, but right now there's nobody panic selling, and so the price points have not dropped. But I'm gonna say watch this space because it's inevitable that uh, I think that property markets will actually drop uh, in the not too distant future, okay? Unemployment rises, okay? So another symptom, we are already at record unemployment, okay? So given those indicators, I'm gonna say fairly confidently that we are going to be in a recession uh, in the not too distant future. It'll be, uh, I guess, just a, wait, a matter of waiting time for that to be formally announced. Now, the cause of that, well, that's because debt levels have actually risen too high and that repayment cycle that I was talking about before the ability for us to pay back our debt. So we've stopped spending, now we're actually paying back debt, uh, means that our spending has actually slowed down. Um, so the indicators on that were actually there prior to COVID-19, okay? So that's why I was saying before, the, uh, the government was actually talking about that cash ban in order to take us into to negative interest rate territory even before COVID happened. And so COVID has kind of, just kind of, pushed us over the edge, I think, is uh, kind of the, the way I would actually read that. 
So the remedy for this, well, there's only really one remedy, uh, which is lower the interest rates to stimulate spending, okay? So, but where do you go if interest rates are all, already at record lows, okay? And how do banks lend when unemployment is so high and property values are starting to drop? So if, if you as uh, somebody wanting to borrow funds have got less income coming through and your property price points are going down, you've got no equity and you've got no serviceability, so the ability for you to actually borrow and actually get credit, even though those interest rates are so low and so cheap, it's actually gonna get really, really challenging, I think, moving forward. So the other way to do this is governments can actually print money to actually stimulate jobs. And they've already injected billions into the economy, but what they've injected is really intended to only last for six months. Now, will they put a second round of, of uh, injections afterwards? I'm gonna say almost certainly that they will. Uh, but they're going to try and get us out of uh, uh, hibernation first uh, and, and see if the economy starts to come back to life all by itself before they bring in the defibrillator, defibrillators and actually uh, try and do that. Because if the government spends money, that invariably means that the government has debt. And if the government has debt, well, they're going to be in a position where, uh, similar to us borrowing money, the government can spend but they're spending future funds, which means that at some point in the future, they have to pay that back. And there's only a few ways that they can pay that back when they're borrowing so much money. Uh, and one of them uh, I'm gonna come, on, come to fairly soon. So in an, in an extreme uh, case from a recession point of view, there's a thing called deleveraging. So uh, deleveraging is where basically the, the values of things like the stock market and the property market drop to a point where the banks no longer have uh, certainty that the equity that is sitting in the property is actually going to cover the debt that's actually owed on it. And at that point in time, banks start doing things like margin calls and uh, those sorts of things. So deleveraging is when we're not only is it recession, but boy, is it, it, uh, it going to hit us pretty hard. So that's in an extreme case. So will there be a deleveraging? I guess this is the, I guess the next question. And we're not gonna really know the answer to this until we've officially been into uh, the recession period. And then that recession period has had a little bit of a chance to try and recover. But if we understand that a deleveraging is potentially possible, then we can look for the symptoms of it uh, well, well in advance. So what are the symptoms? Well, unemployment at record highs, so few people with cash to spend. Well, that's already the case. So, you know, we're, we're certainly there. The stock market and property markets crash, okay? So right now the stock market is sitting on the, the brink of potentially dropping. Well, if it drops a second time, and even if it drops a third wave, that's probably where we're gonna to start to, uh, to be potentially into deleveraging territory. And the property markets will tend to follow because stock markets are a lead indicator that that will actually uh, be the case. At that point, there won't be enough equity support to support any loan burdens that anyone will actually have out there. And so uh, people will start to be at a point where they owe more money than what their property is worth, which is a very tricky spot to be in. Okay. So there'll be a credit crunch because people have no equity and no serviceability. If you don't have a job and you don't, and your property is not worth any, anything anymore, then the ability to borrow money becomes almost impossible. So remember that spending transactions comes from both cash and credit. So if you have no ability to get credit, then the only thing we can do is spend with cash. So cash is gonna become king if we get into a deleveraging situation, okay? Um, so cash will be the only thing that can actually uh, be spent. And so the people that already have plenty are gonna be able to be pick up uh, really big bargains moving forward if we get into deleveraging type territory, okay? Lenders stop lending and the borrowers stop borrowing. I've already kind of touched on that, but basically the lenders go, well, we've got no idea where this is gonna end. So we're just not gonna put money out there anymore because there's no point putting money out there if it's just gonna keep dropping and dropping in value. And the government spends more than it earns in tax. Okay, this is probably the key one. So right this very second, government is ramping up its spending. Um, but if people are unemployed, then they can't pay tax. If they, uh, if they can't pay tax, then the potential is that the tax that 
gets earned cannot pay the debt that the government is actually uh, creating. And this is where the, the true deleveraging then kind of gets triggered uh, at that point in time. Okay, so the cause debts have gotten too big to be fixed with lowering interest rates. Um, it's just at the point where it, it's just not, uh, not potential. So the remedy, well, there's only about four things that can actually be done. And pretty much all of them are gonna be done by uh, at the government level. So they can cut spending, what they call austerity. So they have to, uh, and this is everyone. So it's not just the government, but everyone has to go, well, we just have to not spend on all of those nice to haves and only spend on the things that are absolute need to haves. Um, we can reduce our debt and that typically comes in the way of defaults or restructuring. So go and hand the keys back uh, or go to the, to the bank and say, look, there's no way on earth I can pay all of this back, but what if we come to an arrangement where I paid you 50 cents in the dollar or 30 cents in the dollar or those sorts of things. Um, or potentially you would restructure the loan to say, well, it's no longer a 10 year loan, maybe it's a 20 year loan. So I'm gonna pay it back over a longer period of time. So that's kind of how the, the debts will get reduced is either defaulting basically handing the keys back or restructuring with lower interest rates or longer longer terms um, or redistrib redistribution of wealth. Now, redistribution of wealth is code for saying tax. So as there are very, very few people out there with a job, then the people who have a job and certainly the high net worth individuals will start to get taxed even higher um, or anyone with a job will start to get taxed higher. And my concern right now is that with all of the stimulus packages that the governments are doing right this very moment uh, as we speak, they're getting to a point where because of the unemployment rate and because of their spending, we're actually getting to a position where with the number of people employed, the, the amount of income coming in potentially will not be able to pay the debt of what they are spending on these stimulus packages. At that point, they have no choice but to increase taxes. Um, so watch this space. Um, I guess right now we're at a 10% GST, but there's potential that that might be a 12 and a half or a 15% GST in the not too distant future in order for the government to try and get some of the money back for what it's just spent out in advance, okay? And the third way is printing money. Well, that's really the stimulus packages that they're doing. Every time they're printing money, they're effectively creating a debt uh, to themselves or, or, or to others, I should say, uh, and they have to pay that debt back. So will there be a deleveraging? I'm saying it's plausible. Um, I, I can't say categorically that it's actually gonna happen. As I said, we need to officially get into recession territory first. Uh, and then depending upon how the markets globally recover, not just us locally, but how the markets globally recover, whether or not sentiment returns back into businesses and into consumers and spending starts to occur again. If it doesn't, if we don't get that sentiment, if our, if our trading neighbors don't, uh, don't start to recover, then I think that deleveraging is potentially the next step down the food chain. And that's, quite a way away to predict right now, but I'm saying right now, be alert, but not alarmed that it could actually be coming. Okay, with that in mind, is a credit squeeze coming? Well, uh, I'm telling you right now that not only is it coming, but it's already here. Banks are already tightening their lending. So I'm seeing valuations are being very much more conservative on their properties right here, right now. Now they can only use historical sales figures when they do their valuations, but they always have a range. They can be at the high end of the range or the low end of the range. I'm finding valuations coming in very, very low, uh, both for myself and also for members of my community who've, who've come to me and given me feedback to say, hey guys, I, you know, this was worth X uh, any day of the week before and they've given me X minus a bit. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the first part is valuations are gonna be low. The second part is uh, loan to value ratios. Banks are wanting higher LVRs at present. Uh, I know a number of banks that for their commercial loans, they've gone from a 70% LVR to a 60% LVR. Um, I know of other banks that from a residential perspective are looking to do something similar along the, the residential space. So they're wanting to see more equity in the property. 
Now, the, the challenge is how do you get more equity when the valuation is low? So you kind of, the valuation drops what the property is worth and then the amount that they'll borrow compared to what it's worth then drops as well. So you kind of get less and less access to cash. And this is happening already right now. Serviceability, well, the banks are being much more conservative about their sources of income stream, especially rent. So they're not taking into account all of the rent. They're saying, well, what may actually happen, especially right now uh, in the short term period, if people aren't there. Remember, there's a six month moratorium on people not paying rent and, and not, being evict not being evicted. So the banks have to take that into consideration and say, well, we can't rely on that money actually coming in. Uh, so they're being very, very cautious with uh, their assessments of serviceability. So not only have you got less that you can borrow, but the income stream that you've got means that, that they're struggling to actually assess you even against that smaller number. So lending policies are being ratcheted uh, down all around the place. So most banks are now no longer allowing refinancing to access equity out of your lines of credit. So if you want to if you might, you might have a lot of credit that uh, equity, sorry, sitting in your property right now. In the past, you could go and uh, have a line of credit created for that. So you could effectively take it out as pre-approved, uh, as a pre-approved loan and treat that as cash and spend however you want. Most banks now are not allowing that level of refinance. So if you have it, then you can keep it in place. Uh, but there's potential that even uh, pretty soon, that uh, banks might get to a point where they're saying, well, we want to revalue your loan and see whether or not that line of credit should actually stay in place. Uh, so be careful of that as a next step. Uh, and some banks are not lending at all. They've, they've just closed their books and said for particular kinds of policies, we're just not doing anything. So I'm going to say not only uh, are we approaching credit tightening, but I'm going to say we're already here uh, and that it's just go the screws are just going to get tightened a little bit more, a little bit more. So... If you're needing uh, any loans or anything like that, I actually had this uh, a, a very similar presentation to this uh, about five weeks ago now uh, to say you should go and prepare for this very inevitable fact uh, way back then. But if you haven't then, you need to be doing it now. So be prepared, are you ready? I, I'm gonna say be alert, but not alarmed, but you wanna do everything you can like a doomsday prepper uh, and stock up, okay? Now, I'm not saying go get toilet paper. That's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, what I'm saying is you wanna make sure that uh, all your financial uh, situations are clean and ready to go. So assess your current situation. Do not hope and pray, okay? You need to stay up to date from knowledgeable sources as to what is actually happening in the market and look for all of these key indicators to see what is actually happening. Don't listen to media hype. Media loves talking about uh, I guess the negativity of a story, but you need to be looking at the facts and what is actually sitting behind that, okay? You wanna identify any opportunity you can to cut unnecessary expenses in the short term to bring you into surplus. Uh, I am gonna say that that is almost a mandatory right now. If you are trading in, a, in negative territory space, negative geared properties, uh, I guess uh, loans that you're not gonna pay back, all those sorts of things, if you're in that territory right now, then you want to take a very good hard look at your expenses and go, what can I cut to actually bring me back into surplus? Okay. Know at what point your break even is. At what point do you actually go into negative territory? Okay. So this can't be an emotional decision um, when you're making these financial decisions, but you need to understand what is your worst case impact of your situation if we get into a recession. And if we get into a deleverage, make those decisions now as to what could happen. Uh, if you understand that now, you can then start to make an informed decision as to whether or not you want to uh, cut your losses now, or can you afford to hold and ride it out? Now, there are some uh, uh, properties that I've got right now that uh, it's like, I'm gonna chop off a finger to save losing an arm, okay? So for me, I'd rather take a very small loss right now, knowing that the money is off the table. And then later on, it means that I can sleep well at night. I know that my downside is protected. And if we do recover, well, that's just uh, something that I, I, I factored into my decision-making process, okay? So it's not gonna be something I take lightly, but I'm looking at every single one of my properties right now to go, 
which ones fall into that category. And if they do, then, uh, you know, what is that worst case scenario going to look like? Go to look at any upcoming lease renewals you've got both if you are leasing yourself and also if you, uh, so if you are a tenant or if you have tenants. If you have tenants, you want to get to a point where uh, you want them to, to renew their, their lease as quickly as humanly possible and, and go and check with them, go talk to them. What is your employment status? What is your, uh, your ability to pay the loan back? Be proactive and go and actually approach them right now. If you are a tenant, then go and be proactive to your landlord and say, hey, uh, I see there's a bit of pain coming for both of us. What about we potentially renegotiate this right now uh, so that both of us can minimize the impact of this? Um, I've got some legal protection to say I can't be kicked out for six months, but at the end of that, I've got no idea what's going on. If we come to an arrangement now, I can keep my payments going uh, and stay here for long haul, and that's gonna make sure that you're looked after. So make sure you go and have those conversations, folks, no matter which side of the coin that you're sitting there, whether you are the landlord or the tenant, okay? And make sure, make sure, make sure that you seek expert advice on your personal circumstances, okay? Everything that I've given you today, just reiterating it, is educational in nature. It is not in any way, shape or form telling you what you should do for your particular circumstance. So please go and uh, seek expert advice on those. Assess your current situation. So have a look at your assets and liabilities, okay? Have a look at them really hard and see what is truly an asset and what is uh, what liability is gonna get, uh, I guess, much harder to actually service. Have a look at your available equity. Have you got cash at hand? Have you got equity in other properties that right this very second, you may be able to get refinanced. And I say may, okay? It might be possible that you could get a little bit of a nest egg sitting there just by untapping some equity you've got sitting out there. But if you don't do it now, then in a month's time, it's probably gonna to be too late. Okay, what debt are you servicing? There's tax deductible debt and non-tax deductible. Is there anything that from a serviceability point of view, uh, maybe you wanna look at how do I actually reduce some of that debt? What can I actually do? Do I, uh, if I've got some cash sitting in the bank, do I actually go and pay that uh, pay that uh, debt out? Or, you know, do I potentially sell that property? You want to be starting to look at all of those uh, decisions. Have you got any passive cash flow at all, whether it be from rental income, share dividends, anything? Uh, and I'm going to say, as we're moving forward, you want to look at every single one of those passive cash flows and, and make a determination. What is the likely impact if we go into recession? will that passive cash flow disappear? So share dividends, I'm gonna say, it is unlikely that dividends will be paid out in most companies for quite some time uh, in the current market. Now, not all, but most. So have a look at your stocks and go, what's gonna happen? From a rental perspective, do you think the reliability of your income from that rental is still guaranteed moving forward? Uh, have a look at those. Understand other cash flows. So your wage and or profits from projects if you're doing developments, okay? So from a wage perspective, go chat to your boss and go, hey, are we secure right now? Uh, I need to know what is the likelihood of us getting through the next three months, the next six months, the next 12 months. I saw some stats and, and I couldn't find any for Australia. So I'll uh, only talk to these rather than show them. But I sure saw some stats for the US uh, businesses and more than 50% of US businesses do not have enough cash flow to last more than two months. And so if we stay in this pandemic period for more than two months, then businesses are gonna start to get themselves in uh, significant trouble. So that's more than 50% of businesses in the US. I can only hypothesize that Australian businesses will probably be in a very similar boat so go chat to your boss and go, how are we tracking? Uh, you know, do you think that we've still got a, a job moving forward? What can we do to pivot the business and, and operate differently? Lots of businesses are operating from home now. Uh, lots of businesses are operating via Zoom teleconference uh, or other teleconferencing facilities. So what can you do to actually pivot your business to make sure that that uh, cash flow still keeps coming in? Make sure you do a budget. Um, this is a budget that comes, uh, that we give to our students in our uh, property development formula course. And uh, effectively you can go through and do a line item for everything that you've got there. 
work out is it daily, weekly, or monthly expense, and it will actually then work out, well, what is your annual bill? Okay, so how much money do I actually need from a, from a uh, passive cash flow perspective uh, in order to make sure that I can become financially free? Well, here, we're not looking for financial freedom. We're looking for how much money do I need just to keep the lights on? Uh, so make sure you do a budget, okay? Um, if anyone is interested in getting access to one of these uh, budgets, uh, then if you uh, put your email address uh, into this live chat um, and just put uh, email address and budget, please, uh, we'll do what we can to actually get that out to you, okay? Um, you also want to know how much spare money you've got, if you've got spare money and how tight you are to the edge, okay? So be very, very cognizant of doing a budget. You also want to take a look at your assets and liabilities and have a hard look at, is that asset serving you well? Uh, is it generating the rent that you want it to do? Has it uh, received, has it got equity that's sitting there that you can potentially tap into right now? All of those sorts of things. And from a liabilities perspective, you want to be looking at uh, how big a debt have I got? And, you know, is it something where uh, if I sold it right now, I could pay back that debt and I could sleep comfortably, comfortably at night and I don't have to worry if I lose my job or things like that. Um, they're decisions that you need to be looking at, folks. And when you look at your assets and liabilities, I subtract one from the other, that should give you your net asset position, uh, uh, which will then tell you, I guess, how, uh, how rich you are, I guess, for want of a better word, uh, or how well off you are. But, you know, having assets is not cash. Cash is king, folks. Uh, there's no point being, um, a, I guess, a rich man with no cash to put food on the table. So some things to consider. Take a longer term view on your current position, okay? So uh, you don't wanna be making uh, decisions based on knee jerk. You wanna go, what is the long term implications? If we get into a recession, what is the potential recovery timeline? You saw from my stats before that between three and seven years is typical for recovery for most recessions, okay? So take a long term view of, of you when you're sitting and looking at your positions right now and go, can I ride this out? Do, is this something that I actually want to go through? If you are already selling property and you're already in the sales phase, do not get greedy. If you have an, a willing buyer right here, right now, take the money on the table, okay? Um, this is a situation where there are less buyers in the market right now. And if you aren't realistic with your price points and you try to get greedy, that buyer doesn't need to buy you need to sell they don't need to buy uh, and so you know they'll go and look for bargains that are going to be inevitably around the corner and if you uh, if you're looking to offload um, and and you need that sale then uh, you know be very conservative uh, if you are doing a project that has profit in it uh, and uh, you're trying to claw every last dollar of profit out consider whether or not you want to ratchet that profit margin down and go, well, I'd rather walk away with some money than no money at all, okay? If you don't need to sell, so if you're not on the market right now, consider what a two plus year horizon would be on holding that asset. So what might happen with regards to the rental returns it's generating, the, the, the capital gains it's actually generating, all those sorts of things. And can you, can you deem that a holding pattern for that two plus year period. And I say plus, we don't know what the tail end of this is actually gonna look like, okay? If you're midway through a deal, okay? So I've got a couple of projects that are midway through. You need to start looking at, can you afford to pause your project, okay? Just put it on hold. Now, I'm not saying do do that, but I'm saying, can you afford to? Because there's gonna be holding costs associated with that. And you don't know how long that holding cost is actually gonna be sitting there. Or if you finish the project, can you afford to hold the finished asset at the end? So will it actually generate rent for you at the tail end of that in order to cover its holding costs? Uh, so you might, might create 10 brand new widgets. Um, and if it's going to generate rent, you might be able to keep hold of that because you haven't got anyone willing to buy it at this point in time. Uh, so you want to make sure that you understand that circumstance right now and that will determine, do you go ahead or do you pause, okay? If you're not yet in a deal, okay? Get your deal ready finances right now, okay? Get any approvals that you can today 
because it's going to get harder and harder to actually get finance moving forward. And even right now, it's challenging. I gave everybody a heads up about five weeks ago to go and prepare then. But if you didn't prepare then, the best time is now. And if you don't prepare now, I'm afraid that you may actually miss those opportunities uh, pretty soon. Um, if you uh, if you wanting to get yourself deal ready, cash in anything that's currently not serving you well, okay? So I'm not saying fire sale it. What I'm saying is maybe consider what assets do you want to actually uh, put on the, on the table to cash in, pay down some debt and get some cash in the kitty uh, because I think inevitably when the markets drop, there's going to be some buying opportunities that actually sit there. Fundamentally, guys, the, the property market is in good uh, in a good position. So all of the indicators I've talked about were for the economy. But if we look at the indicators for the property market, we've got, uh, you know, population growth, we've got uh, supply and demand issues, you know, there's not enough supply to meet the demand, all of those indicators are in the right direction for property, but the economy indicators are going the opposite direction. And so the two don't uh, line up, get any approvals for any line of credits, redraws, etc. get there now. Uh, while you can. I, I, I can't stress that enough. Uh, and I, what I'm worried about though is for many of you that may actually be too late. Um, and then sit back and wait for opportunities present. Um, I would not be hunting out deals today. I would be very much sitting on my hands going, I'm fairly confident that the market is going to drop. I don't know how much, but I want to look for all of the indicators to know when um, we're starting to get sentiment back and when people are starting to spend back at that point in time, uh, I think that it's probably time to then say, well, now it's actually time to, to jump on a deal uh, moving forward and make sure, make sure, make sure that you talk to your mortgage broker. So if I look at my uh, crystal ball and do a prediction for the next few weeks and I'm not willing to predict any further the next few weeks and again, I want to stress this is not financial advice. Okay, this is a personal opinion uh, based on where I'm seeing things. Uh, I don't have an AFSL license, uh, so I can't give you financial advice. Uh, but what I'm suggesting to you is that uh, with the information I'm giving you from this education point of view, you're going to become a little bit more informed. You can ask better decisions of your appropriate consultants uh, and 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 professionals in their space. Uh, so my crystal ball as to where I think it's going, well, bank lending is titling, uh, sorry, titling, tightening and access to funds will be increasingly difficult to achieve in the next three to six months. So it's going to get harder and harder to get lending. So if you need to get lending, do it now. Don't do it next week. Don't do it the week after. Do it now. Uh, whatever you need to do to prep for that is, uh, is the homework that you need to do. The stock market showing signs are stabilizing right now uh, with, with a new COVID-19 norm, but it's hard to tell whether that is, um, I guess, uh, an attempt to recover or if that's ready for it to just test the market and, and drop again. And I suspect the latter. I suspect that, uh, that we're, everyone's waiting to see, do we get let out? Does the economy start to, to, uh, to, to generate some activity again? And if it doesn't, uh, I suspect because the credit tightening is happening, people will be spending less. I think that uh, inevitably it's going to drop uh, at some point in the in the coming months. Property market right now, um, market activity is very low. So there's less buyers in the market. There's less people trying to sell properties. Things are taking longer to sell. Uh, pricing has been maintained for the uh, short term. But these, the, there's the occasional bargain sale right here, right now, okay? I'm gonna predict in the next two to six months that that is gonna change. I'm gonna predict that we actually are going to have a drop in the property market. Um, and I think what everybody's waiting for is these relief packages to see when they run out uh, and, and what condition the economy is in right now. I think that's what everybody's waiting for. There's kind of everybody's holding their breath but you can only hold your breath for so long. Uh, and so I'm, I'm hypothesizing that, uh, that I guess there's some uh, panic selling about to happen in the property market in the next two to six months. In about three weeks, I'm gonna predict that we're gonna get let out, okay? So, uh, and we'll get let out slowly. There's already some businesses that are able to go back to work. Uh, my wife's business was able to go back to work this week. 
uh, which is fantastic, uh, but it's going to be slow and, uh, and it's not going to be everybody let out all at once. Before we do that, there are three principles that the uh, federal government want to implement. So they want more extensive testing. So the ability to test anyone that's even got a cough or a splutter. Uh, they want the tracing uh, capability, the tracing app that everyone's talking about. Uh, they're wanting to roll that out so that if anyone is infected, then they can press a button and anyone that they've been in close proximity to then knows to then go get tested. So the whole idea is to uh, contain as much as humanly possible uh, any, uh, any spread. And then they also want local response capability. So if they see a, a little hotspot pop up, they want to rapidly shut down those hotspots. So not shut down the entire city or not shut down the entire state, but maybe just uh, one business premise or maybe just one suburb or two streets or something along those lines. They want the ability to, to do that and do that very rapidly uh, is really what they're trying to build the capability of right this very second, okay? I think that we're gonna be slowly released in stages, okay? Uh, we're going to ha have a little bit of a reversal of the original lockdown uh, processes. So whoever was locked up first uh, or sorry, last, I should say, is probably going to be the ones that get let out first. Uh, so it's going to be a, a last in, first out kind of approach is kind of what I'm predicting. Um, there is a presentation that I did last week, which talked about uh, occupations that are actually at high risk. Uh, there's going to be potentially some assessment of those high risk uh, uh, occupations to say maybe they get let out a little bit after, later than everybody else. Um, uh, now that that uh, report was actually a US report, but if effectively the same occupations have similar risks here in Australia. So for yourself, educate yourself, make sure you keep up to date with how and what is happening in the market. This is critical folks. Know what's happening. All of the market indicators are lead indicators into the property world. And that's gonna be a lead indicator into what's actually gonna be happening in your life as well. Understand what your investment strategy is. If you don't yet have an investment strategy, if you're a little bit scattered, now is the time to actually start to hone in on that and start to narrow that down and lock it in. I think that the next six months is not going to be a great time to invest in anything other than yourself. Educate yourself. Spend the six months you've got right now in hibernation to learn what you're going to do at the bottom of the, I guess the inevitable price drops are gonna happen. At the bottom, we know that we've got indicators going in the right direction for, for, for uh, all of our property uh, market. So if that's the case, educate yourself now, will prepare you for when you hit that inevitable bottom so that you're actually ready to actually transact, okay? And, and you can then get a very, very uh, savvy and very precise in what you're trying to actually do. Any alternate funding models that, that might sit out there, you want to start to learn no money down deals. You want to start to learn joint ventures. You want to start to learn options contracts, all those sorts of things. So if you're looking to keep doing deals, uh, banks are, are tightening up their lending. So you want to start looking a little bit more creatively uh, at what are the some of the other alternatives that are actually sitting out there, okay? And no money down deals. So can you do a joint venture with an existing landowner? Can you... Uh, do a joint venture with a money partner? Can you do option contracts? Can you do delayed settlement with early access? All of these different things where you've got uh, opportunities for no money down, you want to then start to look at, okay? So in conclusion, folks, remember the fundamentals of the property market are strong in the long term. So we have really good population growth, okay? We have really good uh, supply and demand challenges where there is not enough supply to meet the demand. And with everything that's going on right now, people are putting less development approvals in place and less properties are actually being constructed. And so by the time we actually get out of this at the tail end, there's gonna be quite a bit of competitive tension between the, the amount of people wanting property and the amount of stock on hand. And so when we rebound, I think the property market uh, has a lot of potential to come back uh, with a little bit of a vengeance uh, but that we're a long way from that right now. But remember that that property market is strong. So you should start to look at, um, I guess, the longer term considerations of that. 
if you can hold, like if you can afford to hold, then consider that strongly against panic selling. Okay, markets will inevitably recover. Uh, it's just how long it will take. So if you can afford to hold, do not panic sell. Okay, there's clearly some downside risk for our housing market. Inevitably, that this is going to happen. Uh, ultimately, um, the impacts are currently uncertain. Time will tell when we start to drop. Time will tell how far we start to drop. Okay. The best thing you can do is stay up to date with all the facts as they're unfolding every single week uh, so that you've got the latest and greatest information to, in order to make your decisions up on, okay? Property is less volatile, but it's slower than, uh, than the stock market, okay? So it's a lag from the stock market. So you saw the stock market drop from a price perspective, but what you didn't see is property market drop straight away. You saw slowing of the property market. The dropping of the property market tends to happen as a lag. So when that second wave hits the stock market, that's when the property market goes, okay, guys, we, we know what's going on here, we'll follow. Okay, so uh, make sure that you, whilst you understand that it's slower, make sure you see those lead indicators and uh, actually understand how they are. Property transactions have already uh, slowed down. So market values will be next, okay? It's not if, it's when, okay? Our stimulus me measures that are in place, they're gonna to help to cushion the blow, and they're, but they're primarily aimed at keeping businesses alive, okay? Now, whether, whether a recession occurs or not, I'm gonna say highly likely. So irrespective of these stimulus packages, I think a recession will hit us. Personal opinion, not, uh, not uh, financial advice. Uh, so be alert, but not alarmed folks, okay? Uh, our current high levels of household debt, these high levels of household debt were already there pre-COVID. Okay, when I talked about those market cycles, we were already in a point where we were, we were slowing down the economy to, because we were too busy paying debt back previous debt. Now, the, the government was trying to stimulate as much as they could by dropping the interest rates, but they just couldn't drop them far enough, okay? Uh, and so that household debt is going to be a burden for us for some time. That was already there pre-COVID. So post-COVID, I guess, and, and the hangover that's going to happen because of COVID means that uh, potentially we could be paying that debt back for quite some time. So uh, be really careful with that, folks. Uh, and if you're cashed up, then I'm going to say to you that there will be inevitable opportunities that present in the next six to 12 months or so. Uh, I would not be buying property today, me personally, uh, I think that that's not the smartest move uh, on earth, knowing uh, everything that's actually happening. But if you are ready, and if you're cashed up right now, and you're watching the market, you're staying up to date, then in six to 12 months time, I think there's going to be plenty of opportunities that, the, that then present themselves. So that's it, folks. That's my, uh, my little bit of an overview of uh, where we are financially, I guess, uh, with the, I guess, the finance financial implications of COVID and the aftermath that's going to occur. So at this point, I'll kind of promote our, uh, our meetups. We typically used to run these in a physical capacity. So in Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne every single month, we've now moved them into a virtual world. Uh, so please feel free to join our virtual meetup community. Uh, every single one of these that we run, we run one for each of our markets, one for Brisbane, one for Sydney, one for Melbourne. But if you are an annual member and if you want to come you can actually turn up to all of them okay so at these i will give an update on the market every single week that we run these uh, events so you'll be staying up to date with information like i just provided uh, but very very specific in and around the property market and very specific in and around your market in your jurisdiction we also have industry experts talking about common issues and challenges that are presenting themselves in and around the industry uh, and especially in this market, uh, you know, the kinds of things that they're seeing happen in and around them. We also have people within our community sharing real deals. So within the real deals, uh, we get to see the good, the bad and the ugly of what is actually happening. Uh, so we can see, uh, learn from the mistakes of others and uh, also assist them, uh, sorry, uh, and also uh, learn from the, the, the positives that have actually come from that as well. Uh, and then on top of that, we've then got uh, our masterminding sessions. So the masterminding sessions uh, help you in your current situation where the community tries to help you and pay it back 
uh, you've been, uh, whatever issue and challenge you're having, somebody in our community has almost invariably had that problem before. So uh, they will attempt to help you as much as humanly possible in actually doing that. If you're interested in coming to these meetups, uh, you have to actually be an annual member in our community. Um, now, our annual membership is typically $250. It comes with uh, a range of benefits. Uh, you'll get all of these virtual meetups. And when we go back to doing them in physical, you'll be able to attend them for an entire year. Every single one of our presentation notes uh, for every presentation we've done all the way back since 2012 is on there, including all the PowerPoint slides and the recordings and that sort of thing. Uh, we have access to thousands and thousands of discounts through uh, a number of suppliers. So uh, close to 40 odd suppliers with discount lighting, flooring, tiling, electrical, kitchens, bathrooms, uh, all that sort of thing. Uh, plus there's many, many more benefits. Uh, so stay tuned. So normally that annual membership is $250. Whilst we're in this COVID world, uh, we're discounting that to $99. You'll get to turn up to three of these events every single month. Uh, so there'll be a Brisbane, sorry, a Brisbane based version, a Queensland based version. Uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. A Brisbane version, a Sydney version and a Melbourne version of those events. Uh, and if you're an annual member, you can turn up to all of them. So you can see what's happening in all of the markets and all the jurisdictions that are sitting in and around you. So feel free to actually do that. So at this point, folks, I am going to uh, see if there are any questions. Now, the last couple of times I've done this live using Zoom to integrate into Facebook, uh, I was uh, technically challenged in being able to see your questions. Uh, so I'm now going to see if I can transition over to the other slide uh, and see whether or, not, uh, whether or not we can actually get some questions. So uh, let me just bring that page down here so that I'm staring at it and see what questions we actually may have sitting in and around out there. So give me two secs, folks, while I uh, just navigate through. Uh, I can see a couple of people that are, uh, I guess, wanting that budget document. So awesome. Thank you, folks. I can see that. Uh, I can see a question from Linda. Do you think money is better in the home built? Sorry. Do you think your money is better in a home build than in bank? Uh, build to hit market early 2021. Uh, holding people will buy uh, and be more confident then. Potentially, Linda, I guess it's really difficult for me to predict what's going to happen in a month's time, let alone in uh, several months' time. Uh, and, and we're talking about uh, early 2021, so that's actually an entire year away now. I'm going to say at that point in time, I, I, for me personally, I, I think that uh, it's inevitable that we're in recession. Do I think that we're going to be out of recession in 12 months' time? I think highly unlikely. Uh, and so it really comes down to... Um, uh, I guess whether or not you think that writing that project out is actually worth that, uh, that right at this very point in time. Uh, now, comments are coming through so quick, it's actually hard to actually keep up with them. Uh, Pramila has got a question. Do you think we have to redraw the money from the loan redraw facility now? Um, if you have the ability to redraw it, I don't think you need to pull it out this very second, no. It's really more about knowing that you've actually got access to that and knowing that that's a reserve fund for just in case. Uh, I would not be pulling money out and incurring debt unnecessarily at this point in time. I would only be preparing for the fact that I may need to uh, actually utilize those funds for something better than, uh, I guess, what you're currently doing. So just be mindful of that. Uh, I can see that Lynn has responded to Pr Pramila, so and uh, and Pramila is then responding. So hopefully I've addressed that. Uh, I can see a number of people saying hello and thanks. So hello and thanks. Um, uh, and Matteo is saying thanks for your updates, focused and professional. You're welcome, mate. Um, uh, glad that you're uh, loving it. Uh, Dan has said, what about WA? So, mate, uh, WA was on our uh, horizon, absolutely. Uh, I guess with all of the things that have happened uh, of late, the expansion of ourselves into those physical WA environments uh, has certainly slowed down. Um, but it's on, the, it's on the agenda, Dan. So, uh, mate, we would love for you to stay uh, in and part of our community. We are certainly not uh, you know, uh, anti-WA. There's plenty of things that we do in all of the other states that apply directly into WA. So there's plenty of learnings that you can actually have from there. 
Uh, and the more people that we've got in that community, the more likely we are to expand there. So uh, we'd love for you to actually reach out into your community in WA, in South Australia, in, in Tasmania, Northern Territory. Um, we are truly intending this to be a national uh, business. Uh, Property Developer Network is in three states already. So we're wanting to take that uh, uh, as big as we can. So, but what we need is the communities in those spaces to actually come to us uh, and hopefully get the value out of these sorts of presentations and our, uh, and our meetups and that sort of thing. Uh, Philip says, worked perfectly. Thanks. You're welcome, mate. Uh, Dan says, I mean to join the group. Uh, anyone can join the group, uh, Dan. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I will put a link into here uh, in a sec as to how to actually join the group. Um, as a matter of fact, see if I can uh, jump over and grab a, um, a link for you right now. So I will just put this link into the, uh, the presentation. That's if anyone is not a member of our Facebook community already, you can certainly join there uh, as we go. Now, other questions, just scrolling down. Um, Paul says, great presentation. You're welcome, mate. Uh, Jane says, thanks as well. Lynn as well. Uh, Rachel says, uh, what if all income sources dry up? Rent, dividends, job, salary, what happens? Uh, if we have no income left, whoops, so it's scrolling too fast. If we have no income left, uh, uh, at all, but being self-employed, we're not applicable for Centrelink. Uh, and I'm not just talking about me, I'm talking about other, uh, about potentially half the country. Um, I'm not a specialist in employment, Rachel, but you've got a very good point there that um, I guess if you're self-employed in any way, shape or form, your ability to, uh, to, to get Credit is always challenging at the best of times because uh, it's always more difficult. So in nowadays, it's going to be even harder to actually get. Uh, and if your income sources dry up, then we need to start to get creative. Um, that's probably all I can say there is to say, what other sources of income can we actually generate? Uh, there's probably a few things that we could deal with offline rather than me trying to give you personal advice publicly. Uh, and, and even then it's kind of ideas and spitballing. Um, uh, I don't have an actual answer for that, Rachel. I'm sorry, but uh, I'm sure that we can uh, have a chat over a uh, over a beverage or two at some point. Um, and Rachel says, "What if somebody already has got an approved loan? Is the bank likely to change it?" Potential, Rachel. Uh, I am aware of several people in our community that had approved loans that had not yet been funded, and at the very last minute, the bank change the approval conditions of the funding. In one instance, they completely withdrew altogether. Uh, in another instance, they said, well, you know, that's 70% LVR we were talking about before. What we really mean was that 60% LVR. So you need to come up with some extra funds. Uh, so right now, it, it, anything that is approved until it's funded, it's not actually there. So, uh, you know, be very, very uh, careful and cautious to make sure that anything you get approved, you actually go and execute before uh, before the, the rules change in and around you. Um, and Peter says, option spreads. Mate, that's, uh, you're talking about uh, share market trading there. Uh, and certainly I understand what it is, but it's not really the topic of today. But, but certainly that is uh, an op opportunity for people who know how to do that. I'm not recommending it. Uh, having been through, uh, I guess, a period of my life where I was using option spreads uh, through a thing called uh, covered calls, um, that went through, I guess, a very similar period in time where there was a, uh, a crisis that happened at the time and I lost my shirt doing that, mate. So uh, it is not something for the faint hearted. Um, okay. Um, uh, Rachel says, yes, true, get creative and do a property development. Uh, thank you, Rach, love, love, the, uh, love that. Uh, Ju says, uh, any hidden dangers in taking up deferral of mortgage payments on line of credit? Uh, I'm not quite sure I actually understand the question there. Any hidden dangers in taking up deferral of mortgage payment on line of credit? Okay, so I think what you're saying, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think what you're saying is, Right now, we have a potential moratorium in not paying loans back for the next six months. So the hidden dangers of that are, well, you still actually have to pay it back. The debt is still owed. Um, the interest is then just added to the loan. So your debt actually goes up. 
Uh, so that is either done in one of two ways. It is either capitalized and you pay it at the end of the loan, or alternatively, it is amortized and spread across the life of the loan, depending upon your lender and how they've actually chosen to actually implement that um, based on the policy underneath. So if you can afford to pay your mortgage, pay your mortgage um, would be my advice. There's no real benefit to, to uh, hoarding it other than maybe just putting a small little cash nest egg uh, to the side. Um, but I would be not wanting to do that for most people. Um, yeah, so, but again, I can't, I cannot give you uh, legal or financial advice on that, but me personally, I wouldn't. Um, but make sure you go talk to your mortgage broker, make sure you talk to your accountant and actually understand that in a little bit more detail. Um, uh, Peter says, you have to adjust. Yes, indeed you do, mate, absolutely. Um, why do you say redraw the loan, Linda? Um, I wouldn't like Rob just, sorry, I wouldn't like Rob just advised. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, so Lynn is talking to Linda. I'll leave those two talking in the background. Um, uh, Jude is saying, uh, while selling off rental. Um, Jude, I, I, I'm gonna suggest that you probably need to go talk to your accountant uh, and also your financial planner and also your mortgage broker as to the implications of that. It may be uh, if you're going through a process of selling off and it's just a short-term cash flow issue, you may be willing to take that small little hit by tagging it on at the end. Uh, but whether or not that's right for you is not my place to say. Um, I'm not legally allowed to say something and especially when it's on public record here. So, uh, and Lynn says, I'd get an offset account against the redraw though. Um, okay, so from the offset against the redraw, um, I'm not going to get into conspiracy theories, folks, but uh, if you happen to have uh, a lot of money sitting in an offset, um, you want to make sure that it is actually uh, spread out over multiple banks. Um, because if we get into recession, and then if after that deleveraging occurs, then if after that, uh, I guess the next real step is banks can uh, start to claw money out in all sorts of places. Uh, so if you've got it spread across many, many places, uh, then it makes it much, much harder for them to actually do that. Uh, there's also limitations on uh, government guarantees on your funds and all sorts of things like that that is really a, uh, a conspiracy theory type conversation and I'd need to be wearing a tinfoil hat to go into that sort of conversation. Um, okay, so I can see a couple more. Uh, Linda's saying, I heard Rob say opposite. Rob, question mark. Uh, free up and get finance ready to buy now. No, what I was saying, Linda, just to be clear, is, uh, and, I, and I haven't been able to follow that entire trail to, to try and join the dots in that particular conversation. But what I'm trying to say is get your finances ready because now is the only time you'll actually get it. Right now you have a job. Right now you have equity in your property. Right now you have uh, I guess all those, uh, all the, the right things that banks look for to say, can you get the loan? I didn't say go spend it. Um, what I said was make sure that you've got your money ready. Uh, and then later on, if you need to, that those opportunities hopefully will present themselves in due course. Um, I certainly don't want, uh, I, well, I certainly wouldn't be uh, pulling money out and actually trying to spend it. And I don't think that's what you're saying, but as I've not followed the entire trail, um, uh, so that looks like it, folks. I think I've kind of uh, found everyone's comments. It's um, always crazy when you're on a live to try and work out uh, exactly who's talking at what, uh, what point in time. Uh, but there you go, folks. I uh, hope you got plenty out of that. Um, please um, smash the like button, hit the share button. Uh, I've put uh, two whole days into pre uh, preparing this presentation. And so please, please, please share it far and wide because uh, I want this message out to the community to say, uh, you know, be alert, but not alarmed, be prepared um, for the inevitable and hope the inevitable doesn't actually come. But uh, I want everybody to, uh, to, to have done their homework and actually be prepared. So uh, that said, folks, I'm going to say that's probably it for now. I can't see uh, any more questions coming through. Um, I can see lots of likes getting smashed on there right now. So thank you, folks. Um, yeah, I, well, actually, I'll hang around for two more minutes. So 
Uh, if anyone has got a question, now's the time to, to, to uh, smash it in here. Let's see what we can actually uh, see what we can actually get. Uh, Rachel says, good job. Thank you. Appreciate that, Rachel. Um, there's always a lag between me talking and, uh, and you guys' uh, questions actually coming through. So uh, Noel says, great session. Thanks, Rob. You're welcome, mate. Uh, anytime. Um, well, I can't see questions coming through, folks. I was willing to hang around, but uh, as there's nobody here, um, I'm going to say thank you very much. I uh, hope you guys got plenty out of that. Please, please, please uh, do what you can to share this uh, with anyone in your community, share it into other people's communities. Um, I want the basic lessons to, to see where we're at in an economy and what is inevitable around the corner. I want people to actually see that because that's not the stuff that is actually being presented in the media. Uh, you know, they're always about hype, whereas I'm trying to, to uh, give you just the facts and see, uh, so that you guys can actually make educated and informed decisions based on that. Um, okay, so that said, folks, uh, I'm going to love you and leave you at this point in time. Thank you all. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll hopefully see you at our next meetup. Make sure that you uh, follow that link uh, to our uh, meetups, become an annual member. Uh, and then uh, I guess then we'll see you at our next meetup, which is next weekend, folks. Bye for now.